FOMO. Creativity and persuasion are, are two different things, right? But oftentimes, we, we sort of design these, these situations where we almost treat them as one. Like if you're not persuasive, you're not creative. But, that, but that's not true. You can have a great idea. You could be a brilliant candidate, have a brilliant product, and you could still be dismissed. And, and so, you know, that is really what got me interested in this idea of who are these backable people who seem to be able to, you know, get inside a room and convince us to take a chance on them. And the trick of it is sometimes, oftentimes, it's when they're not, a, they're not, not the obvious choice. They don't have the obvious idea but we still feel compelled. That's Sunil Gupta, author of Backable, the surprising truth behind what makes people take a chance on you. I'm your host, Patrick McGinnis, and this is FOMO Sapiens. With the world spinning out of control, it can be impossible to know what to do and what to miss out on. That's called FOMO, which is short for fear of missing out. How do I know? Because I coined the term and I'm the world's first FOMologist. And this is the show where I ask entrepreneurial thinkers, people I call FOMO sapiens, how they live and work with conviction no matter what life throws at them. FOMO. FOMO. Hey, FOMO sapiens, welcome back to the show. FOMO. I'm going to start today's episode with a like pretty obvious thing, which is that failure sucks. However, I found this quote that I like from James Joyce. Mistakes are the portals of discovery. And in fact, my guest today used his own failure as a portal of discovery and has gone on to do some pretty amazing things. And he's going to tell us how he did it, what he learned, and also how we can all find ways to be backable, to convince people to believe in us so that we can turn the ship around. Sunil Gupta is the founder of Rise, and he's on the faculty at Harvard University. That's fancy. He writes about his experience in a new book called Backable. And he talks about the fact that he went from being the face of failure in the New York Times to being the new face of innovation for the New York Stock Exchange. That's a pretty big pivot. And he's had tons of success. His ideas have been backed by firms like Greylock and Google Ventures. And he's invested in startups like Airbnb, Calm, and SpaceX. Sunil also serves as an emissary for gross national happiness between the United States and the Kingdom of Bhutan. And by the way, we'll be talking about that next week on After Hours in detail. So if you're interested in learning more about that, do check it out. Now, the other thing about it, like Sunil is kind of cool is that his brother is the one and only Dr. Sanjay Gupta of CNN. And I just want to ask, what did your parents feed you to have such incredible people? It's just a really impressive family. Now, the reason that I wanted to have Sunil on is because I think some of the takeaways of this conversation are important. Number one, he talks about how he leaned into failure and he'll talk about his failure, but he didn't run from it. He sort of just kind of accepted it and owned it and it got him into some really surprising places. I also love the fact that he teaches us all how to be investable, how to be backable and figure out how we can make our success feel inevitable to the other people around us so that they want to help us out. And of course, he talks about how to use FOMO for good, because if you're going to sell somebody something, you need a little FOMO to do that. That's how you close the deal. Speaking of deals, I want to make a small deal with you. I have my small ask today, and I want to ask you to please go to my website, FOMOSapiens.com or PatrickMcGinnis.com. I have two websites, so pick one, or if you really, really feel like it, look at both of them, and please make suggestions. I was just going through my website this morning, and I found a mistake. And I thought to myself, oh man, that's not good. I can't believe how long has it been there. So I would love your thoughts on what you'd like to see me add to my website. If something doesn't work right for you, if you don't like something, just send me an email at letsconnect at patrickmcginnis.com or connect with me on Instagram or on Twitter and let me know what you think. I would really appreciate it. All right. And moving on now to the interview. So as I mentioned earlier, Sunil found himself intimately acquainted with failure But I didn't realize how intimately until I started reading his book and I realized he ended up in the New York Times in an article called Wearing Your Failures on Your Sleeve. And I looked at this article. Go look it up. It's interesting. And apparently, if you Googled failure right after the article came out, you get a picture of Sunil. So that is, that's, uh, I don't know what to do with that. So to start our interview, I asked Sunil to tell me exactly how that all happened. (laughs) Well, you know, I get a call from an organizer of a conference called FailCon, which literally stands for Failure Conference. And she says, hey, you know, uh, you've been nominated a couple of times, actually, to be to be a speaker at this conference. And, uh, and you know, at the time, I, I uh, had, was raising money for my startup, 
and uh, it was going nowhere. I was getting rejected by every investor that I pitched. And I thought, you know, this might be an opportunity to, 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 to meet some people. I was, you know, pretty new to Silicon Valley at that point. You know, maybe I could uh, find some investors. I don't know why investors would really hang out at a place called Failcon, but, you know, I was, I was willing to try anything. So uh, I ended up giving a speech, and, uh, and I did not know that there was a reporter from the New York Times in the audience. You know, fast forward to my apartment uh, in, in San Francisco, and, and I'm with my wife, and we open up the Saturday New York Times, and it's a full length article on failure with my face at the top. And the funny thing is, Patrick, like when, when that kind of thing happens, uh, you know, we're, I, th- I think to a certain degree, we, we, a lot of us, including, including me are, are trying to convey this, this image of success. Um, and, and then all of a sudden there's this, this, this massive article on failure. And, and like you said, I mean, at that time, if you would have Googled failure, you, you, one of your top search results would be my face, literally my face. And, and so I think you can kind of take it in one or two directions. One is you can kind of bury your head in the sand and kind of hope that goes away, you know, hope that eventually over time that search result goes down and down in ranking. The other thing is you can embrace it, which a friend of mine kind of convinced me to do, which is, hey, you know, you've been reaching out to all these people who have not been giving you, you know, any time and you've been reaching out to them for advice and this could be a good icebreaker. Like, why not actually start emailing people? And so I, I did. And, and I would email people and I'd say, hey, you know, here's a link to an article. And as you can see, I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, would you be willing to grab some time with me? Yeah, I would love to get your advice. Uh, and, it, and, it, and it worked. It, people, people, were, people really responded to it. They thought it was funny or they thought, they thought, uh, they thought it was humble, you know, and vulnerable. And, 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 I, and I, think they, I think that uh, uh, it really sort of paved the way to these conversations that ended ended up, you know, making me realize how how wrong I was approaching being inside a room, right? Trying to pitch my ideas all along, and it created the foundation for this book. When I read that, it made me think about my own journey, and I think a lot of people who are listening have had that time in their career where, or in their life, where you're sort of like, you're sort of like, wow, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. Like I knew what I was doing. I went to school. I got a job. You know, I was on the ascendant, and then. You sort of have a bunch of things stringed together and all of a sudden you don't know where you are. You don't even know how to tell people where you are. People are like, how are you doing? And you're like, well, you know, let's talk about you, right? Yeah. Now you come from a family of people who have done amazing things. Your mom uh, was an immigrant from India and became the first female engineer at Ford Motor Company. Your brother, we all know, Dr. Sanjay Gupta. I've seen him, I think I saw him like do a brain surgery live on air at one point. So, you know, you, you have this, you have this interesting family and, and I can imagine there's pressure on yourself and the desire to, to not want to fail. And so leaning into failure is something that's hard to do, but you did it. And I thought that that was really powerful because you're right, failure or the ability to just say, okay, I, I honestly don't know where I am right now and I need help is very disarming. So explain to us, because I think especially this year, so many of us have been back on our heels. For somebody who's listening, how did you get the get to the place in your head where you were willing to start being much more vulnerable? Well, you know, I think having an article on failure that's that's published and everybody's kind of reading it and it goes viral sort of kind of puts you a little bit in that spot. And um, and to be honest with you, man, like I, I was I was kind of at that point where I was ready to try anything. You know, I mean, I, I, I'd say that my career up until that point had sort of felt like it wasn't, you know, it was it was it was lackluster. There was a lot of there was a lot of failure along the way and that I kind of just been almost sweeping underneath the rug. Um, but you know, I'd started a couple of companies that failed. Um, the company that I just worked with, Groupon, you know, had just lost like eighty percent of its market market share. Um, you know, it just it wasn't it wasn't feeling right, and I was I was clearly I clearly needed to make some make some changes. Then I think the only way to make those changes, I think, that is to is to I think ask for is to ask for help. I, I think I think that I mean, you know, the thing that I've learned. I think Bill Gates, you know, had it right when he said that success is a lousy teacher. And what I realize is that if I'm only trying to talk about my success, I don't really have a lot to talk about inside a room, you know, and especially at that time. I, I didn't, you know, I, I would have these conversations and I would sort of almost try to present my resume or present my experience, but it wasn't very interesting or insightful. Um, but it was when I started talking about failure that it actually was insightful. Like, why did Groupon lose 80% of its market value? What, what changes did we make? All, all of a sudden, you know, I realized people were a lot more perked up and interested during those moments. Um, so, you know, I, I, think, I think that um, 
you know, once you end up having a few of those conversations, I think it can be very empowering, you know, and I've noticed that here on this podcast, like, I think you have a way of, of, of getting people, I think, to open up about like both success and failure. And from, at least from, from what I hear and when I, when I'm listening to this podcast, like some of the most interesting conversations I've, I've heard have been about like what went wrong. Yeah, it's the failure. The failure makes you appreciate everything else. And as somebody who has had some spectacular failures in my life where I was literally didn't want to get off the couch. And I'm not one of these people who wants to do the hero's journey and just say, like, I failed so bad and look at me now. That's not the play, because believe me, there are plenty of challenges ongoing in, in my life and everybody else's. But I, I completely agree with you. And what I think is great about your message and uh, as I read the book is you talk about the importance of learning how to convince people to take a chance on you. And you give an example that I found really compelling. It's You compare the engineer who spotted the design flaw and the challenger who couldn't convince people to take it seriously. And I remember that because, you know, that was something I saw as a child. It was actually my brother's birthday. Mm. And, uh, you know, so I watched this with horror. It was one of these things we'll never forget. I remember where I was when I heard about it. Yeah. And then you compare that with Billy McFarland of Firefest, who yeah. sells smoke and mirrors and his ability to get people to back him in a million different ways, despite the fact that it was a completely ridiculous idea. And so being able to convince people to, to believe what you're saying to back you is a very important skill. And so I just want to talk about that a little bit. You know, yeah. Speaking of Firefest, right? You know, um, what is it about a guy like that versus the NASA engineer as you, you started thinking about what makes people successful? What is it that people do successfully when they convince people to, to back them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we all, I mean, we all know that creativity and persuasion are, are two different things, right? But oftentimes we, we sort of design these, these situations where we almost treat them as one. Like if you're not persuasive, you're not creative, but that, but that's not true. You can have a great idea. You could be a brilliant candidate, have a brilliant product and you could still be dismissed. And, and so, you know, that is really what got me interested in this idea of who are these backable people who seem to be able to, you know, get inside a room and convince us to take a chance on them. And the trick of it is sometimes, oftentimes, it's when they're not, a, they're not, not the obvious choice. They don't have the obvious idea, but we still feel compelled. And I think that's a very, it's a very powerful thing because I think we can all use a little bit of that equality. It's, it's not, it's not just for celebrities. It's not just for CEOs whatever type of change you're trying to make with your career, with your company, with your community. Um, you know, we need, we need hiring managers. We need partners. We need colleagues, teams, even friends and family to, to take a chance on us, to believe in us. So that's what got me really inter interested in, 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 in sort of this, this topic, you know, but one, one thing that I, I saw along the way is that there are a lot of backable people out there uh, who don't necessarily have the right intentions. They don't necessarily have the highest integrity. And I, and I think that, you know, I mean, you, you, we see stories like Theranos and, and Fire Festival that I think sort of drive this home, which is like those people are plenty backable and they had very, very high conviction in what they were and what they were selling. Um, and by the way, the people that back them were also very reputable, right? I mean, just take Fire Festival, for example. I mean, the people who got behind... Fire Festival, he was able to raise $26 million in funding. And, and these were people with like investing track records. Um, and he was not somebody who had an entrepreneurial track record for success. Um, and yet he was still able to convince them to, 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 to go along with this. Um, I, you know, for me, I feel like, you know, I could, I wish that I could medically somehow transport this backable gene from people like Billy McFarland into people like Bob Ebeling. And Bob Ebeling was a, a, you know, an engineer on the NASA Challenger team. And he was looking at the data the, the, the day before the Challenger was sent up. And he, he noticed that the temperatures overnight were going to freeze these, these O-ring shaped seals. And he felt like that was going to make the, 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 the whole thing unsafe. So he calls a meeting he gets all of his colleagues into a room. He presents the data. It's pretty cut, and, pretty cut and dry, right? And he gets dismissed. And they say, "No, we're 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 gonna we're gonna proceed." And the thing thing about Bob Ebeling is, you know, you know, uh, space space shuttle Challenger goes up, it disintegrates within ninety seconds, and he blames himself. He blamed himself for the rest of his life. One of the last interviews he did was with NPR, and he said, "God should not have chosen me for that job." 
because I had everything. I had all the facts. I had all the data in my hand, and yet I couldn't convince the people inside the room. And and so I I, I am trying to you know this book is designed for the Bob Ebelings. It's designed for the people who who I think have the right intentions that have that have the have the high integrity. That, and and to help them learn how to sell an idea, I'll say one of the one of the first things that occurred to me was that I, I really expected that a lot of it was going to be around about style. I, I thought a lot of it was going to be around things like hand gestures and eye contact and pacing, right? But I that that could not have been further from from the case, like further from the truth. You have you have certain backable people, of course, that have kind of a Dale Carnegie esque, Toastmasters esque way about them. But there are plenty of backable people out there who are much more shy, quiet, introvert, introver- introverted, but backable nonetheless. And if you want an example of that, just you know, go go search for the number one most popular TED Talk of all time, and what you'll find is a very unTED like presentation. It's a guy named Sir Ken Robinson who gives this brilliant talk on education. But he's got one hand in his pocket. He's got a slouch. He sort of meanders on and off script. But it, it, it's, an incre- it's an incredible talk. And the thing that I realized over time is that the common denominator amongst backable people isn't style and it isn't charisma. It's not charisma that convinces people. It's conviction. Backable people take the time to convince themselves first and then they let that conviction shine through in whatever style it is that feels most natural to them. And so I love that uh, because... So much of of living a life where you are independent from the swirling winds of FOMO and FOBO is being a person who has conviction. So, as you think about the you know the, the person that, that that may be lost or having trouble or has suffered some failure, and then you draw a line to that same person who is living with conviction and is able to go into a room and get people to believe in their vision, and then. Bring them over to their side. Tell us a couple of the ways that you can do that. Yeah. You know, so one of the things that I, I, I constantly have to remind myself of is, is a story that when I was uh, when I was in the waiting room of a guy named Brian Grazier, who is a Hollywood producer. He is, you know, he's he's won over 130 Emmys, dozens of Oscars, but he also invests in companies and he runs large teams. And so when I was when I was sitting there in his waiting room, there were there were people there ready to pitch him on all sorts of things, and you could just tell, man, like the, the anxiety in the room was just high. It was really high. People were nervous, and so when I went back to see Brian, I I, I said to him, "Look, you got a room full of nervous people out there. If I could go out there and give them one piece of advice, what would it be?" And he thinks about it for a moment, and he says, "Give me something that I can't easily find on Google." Give me something that's not easily Googleable, and that turned out to be a pattern amongst backers, whether that be hiring managers or investors or you know casting directors. Is that is that the, you know these great presentations and great pitches, great meetings generally tend to be built on an insight, something that's not obvious, that you personally have gone out and and, and received. And that could have been through talking to customers, talking to competitors, customers, test driving products. Like you really put yourself out there and found something and you're kind of almost bringing it back and saying, look at what I found. And based on what I found, here, here's an idea, right? Here's something that I want to show you. It's, it's inspired something in me. And in the book, we, we refer to this as an earned secret, as an earned secret. And again, it's not just the type of thing that works in Hollywood and Silicon Valley. I mean, the, the other day, I was talking to a mom who was, who was returning to the workforce, and she was really interested in her role at a social media company. But the trick of it was she didn't use the product. It wasn't a product. She, it was a Gen Z-focused you know, product. And so she, she, uh, you know, she did something remarkable, though. She interviewed every single one of her daughter's friends. And she asked them, like, what do you like about the product? What do you not like about the product? You know, what do you wish, what do you wish was there uh, that's not there right now? And then she had them send her screenshots of their experience. So these little moments of delight or a request. And she takes with her into this interview, which was over Zoom. It was, it was you know, during pandemic times. And she, she's got her phone. She's got her phone. And she's showing this, this hiring manager, this gallery of screenshots, these moments and insights. This guy is so impressed 
that not only does she get the job, but in the middle of the interview, he ends up patching in one of the UX designers so that he can see some of the things that she's gathered. And again, like this is somebody who previously had not used the product, but by putting herself into the story and by by really collecting these earned secrets, these insights, she was able to set up this backable moment where she gets the job. All right, everybody, if you want to get that job at Clubhouse, now you know what you have to do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> now, right. uh, one of the things you talk about, it, you talk about that, the sort of the earned insights, and which I really love because it's about doing your homework. And then you go on to another point, which is something I've always said. So when I read this, I was like, this guy, you know, he's my kindred spirit, which is make it feel inevitable. Yeah. People will come and present an idea to me, and I've probably in my career seen 500 pictures or more. I don't know. I haven't, haven't counted them, but many, 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 many. And one of the things that really impresses me in a good pitch is that it sort of feel like the train is leaving the station and these people have figured it out. They've got a plan. They're going to go do it. And it's just going to happen. And it's like you can invest or you can get involved or you cannot. But regardless, like this is going to happen. And one of the secrets to doing that is FOMO. And, you know, we're on FOMO Sapiens here today. And you talk about FOMO in that chapter, which I appreciate. And so I would love you to dig into that because, uh, you know, you make a very good point. FOMO in and of itself, on its own, not enough. You need momentum and, and other factors as well. But get into that for us because I think yeah. that is the, that's the, the, if I think about it, like, you know, in terms of like cycling, it's that what makes the flywheel spin and where everything sort of comes together. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, you look at like Daniel Kahneman and and a lot of the research that he was able to sort of, uh, I think, give us, I think it's really sort of based on this, which is like he he showed us that the, the pain that we get as human beings from making a bad decision can be twice as powerful as the pleasure that we get from making the right decision. And, and that's the context, like that's the mindset of anybody, I think, when you're trying to get when you try to get them to do something new or bet on something that's you know not obvious, and so we can't approach that conversation simply by pointing out the positives. We really have to we have to work on neutralizing the negative as well. And one of the ways that I think we go wrong is sometimes when we when we just focus on the positive, we want to talk about why something is new and exciting, right? Like it's a new idea and it's an exciting idea. But what we miss out on is why this idea is inevitable, why it's inevitably going to happen. Because again, we're not just trying to point out the positive, we're trying to neutralize sort of the fear of making that bad bet. And so one of the things that I think backable people do, and Patrick, you've talked about this as well, FOMO, is like really just getting an understanding of where the world is headed, irrespective of your idea. So they, they do what I call in the book, putting on their anthropologist hat where it's not about them in the beginning. Like the idea doesn't stem from them. It stems from inevitably, like the world is headed in this direction. And let me let me lay out that case for you. Let me show you sort of over the next three to five years or however, whatever time frame, you know, where things are headed. And then let me talk about how this idea fits into that narrative, right? And I, and I think that that is that 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 is that tends to be so much more effective because again, what you've done is you've sort of painted this vision of like, look, the train is leaving the station, and 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 the way the way to get on board is is through this idea. Um, and I, you know, oftentimes it was it was funny when I was when I was sharing this concept, one of the pieces of pushback I got was the example of Steve Jobs, and people would say, well, wasn't Steve Jobs kind of the opposite? Didn't he sort of wasn't he the new and exciting guy where, where it's like, I think the world should be this way. And so I'm going to make it this way. But that's not, that's not quite what happened. I mean, if you look at the lead up to the iPhone, there were many, many sort of patterns that were coming into play that were sort of pointing to the inevitability of the iPhone. In fact, even in his speech, Steve Jobs said, I'm simply skating to where the puck is already going. So again, not just making it new and exciting, but making it feel inevitable. And FOMO is a big part of that. Yeah, and FOMO is about more than the fact that you really love this business idea. Like founders come in all the time, and for all of you who are listening who are working on ideas, I want to say, I'm saying this because it's coming from a place of love. Just because you really love this idea and you feel like you were meant to do it, 
That's awesome. And I'm glad you're getting self-actualization as you build your business. But investors don't, that does not drive an investment decision. Yes. Your passion means that you're going to work hard. And that's part of the equation. But having what you said, you know, this idea of the inevitability that this, the world is going in this direction. And even if you think about like Elon Musk stuff, right. And some of the things he does, it's, he's very audacious, but the ideas he has are ideas that people have been dreaming of doing in the future. It's just that he's the one who's going after them first, but it, nobody's going to say like, well, an electric car, that's impossible to conceive. I mean, we all think it's going to go there. He's just going to find the first route. So it's a very powerful concept. Another powerful concept that you talk about that I really love. Uh, towards the end of the book, you talk about playing the game of now, which I I just really liked it because I think right now we're in this really interesting moment where we're about to re reemerge from this period of reflection, and there's gonna be a lot of living that's gonna happen. So talk about the game of now and how you're gonna play it in 2021. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I I, I love I love the possibility that comes out of you know, the comparisons that we see with like the roaring twenties, like, could we have that? Could we have that again? And when people sort of, when we, when we come out of this, is there going to be an increase in art and creativity? And I, I would love to, I would love to see that. And, and, you know, I, I think, you know, the, as I, as I was, as I was writing this book, again, what I was looking for was patterns. Like what were the, what were the patterns that were not obvious amongst people who tend to be really, really good inside a room. And one of the things that, that over and over again, I found is that, uh, if you rewound the clock, they were very different than the way that we see them today. And that's really, that's really important to note. And, and, and I think that deep down, we all kind of know that's true because we see the evolution in ourselves and can only assume that other people evolve as well. But I think when it comes to people we admire, sometimes we sort of look the other way and we kind of sometimes assume that they were always that way. I remember the first time that it became, a, that that concept kind of came abundantly clear to me. It was 2004 and I was working backstage at the Democratic National Convention. I was a junior, junior writer. And, uh, and uh, you know, there was, a, there was a state senator from Illinois who nobody really knew who was about to get up on stage. And so I, I watched that speech that Barack Obama gave that night, his first sort of coming out speech from backstage. And while the world seemed to be watching him, I seemed to be watching the world and the way that they were reacting to him. And I became one of, you know, I think millions of young people that night that sort of, you know, fell in love with Barack Obama and, and, and his story. And I, I decided to go digging. I wanted to understand more about it. And what I found really surprised me, which was that just four years earlier, he had run for Congress and he had lost and he had lost big. It was like a two to one margin. But the thing that was even more surprising to me was this uh, was how he was received during the campaign. People described him as boring, stilted, professorial. There was a, a reporter named Ted McClellan who covered that entire campaign who said Barack Obama is so dry that he sucks all the air out of the room. And then four years later, he is this bastion of hope and energy and inspiration. Uh, and it just, it just struck me that these stories, when we, were, when we sort of go back in the book, right? we see the current chapter, but we go back to early chapters, they can be very different. And so the thing that I think holds us back is, is, is this idea that I'm not ready right? I'm not ready to speak my mind. I'm not ready to run with that idea. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not ready to step into that leadership role. But the thing is, you know, just like Barack Obama, every time I looked at backable people and rewound the clock on their story, I found that none of them were really ready. Like three friends from design school were not ready to start Airbnb. A mid-level talent manager wasn't ready to start SoulCycle. Uh, a 15-year-old from Stockholm, Sweden, wasn't ready to build an environmental movement. And yet today, Greta Thunberg is Time Magazine's youngest person of the year. And, and let's just be clear, like it was, there were setbacks, there were failures, there were disasters along the way, and a lot of those hurt. But I think that backable people tend to have a mantra, they tend to have a mindset, which is that the, the opposite of success is not failure, it's boredom. So that you know, for me, I I I, I think I think that's that's the 
that's the thing that I try to keep in mind. And, you know, 2021, I, I played this little game with my daughters and my, one of my resolutions is making sure that I, I do it every single day, which is I ask them two questions. The first question is, what is the meaning of life? And they say, to find your gift. And I say, well, then what is the purpose of life? And they say, to give it away. And it's all based on this quote from Picasso. The meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose is to give it away. And I think backable is all about how do we how do we give our gift away? It's very powerful. And I love, by the way, what you said about boredom, because if you ask me what my my life goal is, uh, I didn't I don't say finding the gift giving away, which I should do because that sounds way cooler. <laughs> Mine is I never want to be boring and I never want to be bored. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so that, that's, that's how I'm thinking about 2021, but I, I, I'm, I really appreciate that perspective. Now, Sunil, the book is called Backable and the website, if you go to backable.com, which Sunil got, it was available. So by the way, that's inspiring. If you have a, a business idea, go see if the website's available. He got backable.com, which I would have thought you paid a lot of money for. So well played. Yeah, um, it's just available. I don't know. I just know these words are just available. This is, uh, this is another reason why, uh, you'll never be bored. Sunil Gupta, thanks for being here. Patrick, it's been great, man. Thanks a lot for having me. FOMO. Big news. We now have a brand new website. So head over to FOMOSapiens.com where you can listen to past episodes, learn more about the show, and find out how to advertise. Also, head over to Spotify where you can find and follow playlists of the best of the show. You can also connect with me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on LinkedIn. I'd love to hear from you, so don't be shy. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstrom. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMO. FOMO. FOMO.